the opening address from Mina for this conference and it looks to me that the majority of you are uh, Mina people, some people aren't, but it looks like most of you are. So what I'd like to talk about really I think are some of the things that are affecting uh, our youth in this country and really everywhere else because now we're dealing with a global phenomenon which is the monoculture of consumption, consumerism and uh, particularly Western culture which is taking over the world in incredibly rapid ways. I was just for instance in Spain and we spent a month there and the effect of Americanization, globalization, everywhere you saw billboards with Western actors who suddenly were transformed into Spanish speaking people because their quotations were all in Spanish. A lot of them were for alcohol uh, campaigns. They had a famous actor called Neen Leeson, I think, or something like that, and several others. And when you look around and see these famous faces on billboards that everybody seems to know who they are, and for some reason people seem to be interested in what type of things that they drink, even though they probably don't drink those things, but they're paid massive amounts of money to at least pretend that they drink those things because if they do other people tend to follow them. Now one of the interesting things about human beings sociologically is that human beings tend to imitate. In fact Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah in a book called I'lam al muwaqqeen says that one of the proofs for taqlid which is the idea of somebody imitating somebody else if they don't know themselves is that the fitra or the inherent nature of people is to imitate. Human beings tend to imitate. And if you look at uh, this culture, the people that are put up as models that people are now imitating are done through very sophisticated techniques that have been studied very seriously and many of the people involved in these activities are actually, they have PhDs in psychology. Just to give you an example, in New York, and somebody sent this to me, it was a program that was shown on CBC. In New York they had a child psychologist uh, who was on this documentary about, about using advertisements and directing ads at children. And they actually direct ads now at children that are two years of age. In other words, there are actually television ads that are designed for children that are two years of age. And this, at a certain point, this interviewer asked this man, don't you find this unethical? And at that point it was this, as if this person actually didn't have that word in his vocabulary. Any word that either unethical or ethical, anything with ethical. And he looked at this uh, person and he said, unethical, why? Why would it be unethical? And she said, because you're manipulating people uh, who really don't have the ability to discern because of their age that they're unaware that they're being manipulated. And he said, well, if, if we didn't do it, somebody else would. And this was his type of justification. Now, I think that actually that the question asked by this woman was, I think it was an ingenuous question for the simple reason that I think that it's not just children that don't realize they're being manipulated, it's actually everybody. It's the adult population as well because there's a lot of people that think that they can watch these things and they don't think that they're being affected by it. They actually believe somehow that they're immune to it. They, well, it's affecting all these other people but I'm not affected by it. Right, as he puts on his Ray-Ban glasses and, and ties his Nike shoes and, and gets into his Lexus car. I mean, all of those things, why does he have them? He, he didn't really choose them. They, they were actually implanted in his mind because he's buying on impulse. 
most people, in fact, they call it impulse buying. They don't actually buy because they want something or, or they need something. They actually have been programmed to buy these things. Now, the average person in this country is seeing, according to studies that have been done on this, 3,000 commercials a day. This doesn't include television, this is talking billboards. A lot of this doesn't include like t-shirts, all these people going around with t-shirts. And I, I saw somebody today, a Muslim, he had this Calvin Klein thing. I said, is he paying you? Do you have a contract? He said, no. I said, well, you're getting robbed because you're giving him free advertising and you're not getting any money out of it. That's un-American. <laughs> But that's the thing, they, they don't, why is he wearing a t-shirt that says Calvin Klein on it, who's a pornographer basically, and then he's got a hat that says, I love Islam. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something's, you know, it's one of those what's wrong with this picture type thing. And I don't think he's really thought about it, that's my guess. I don't think he's really thought about it because a lot of us haven't thought about these things. A lot of us have been asleep for a long time. A lot of these experiments were done when we were little kids. We were put in front of televisions. We didn't realize what was happening to us. It was actually a, a form of child abuse. Unfortunately, most of the parents didn't even realize because the television in this culture is used, and, and I wrote an essay about this, it's used like to the Pied Piper of Hamlin. I don't know if people know that story, but when I was a little boy, that was one of the stories that was read to me. And it was about a group of children. Well, the story is that a bunch of rats take over this town, and they're driving the town crazy. So this piper comes in, and if you know uh, European and Western motifs, the piper is usually the, the devil. Pan, Puck, and there's a lot of, but the Piper is usually the devil. So the Pied Piper comes into town and he says, I'll get rid of your pests for you, but you have to pay me. This is ancient pest control. And so they agree on a price. Sure enough, he takes his food out and all these rats follow him out of town. And he dumps them over the ocean at a cliff and he comes back and he wants his pay. Well, now people are greedy by nature. And so the mayor decides, you know, well, they were probably left anyway and, and uh, we're not going to pay you. So he gets upset and what he does is he plays his pipe and all the children follow him out of the town. And he takes all these children and they're hypnotized. You see, they can't, and, and he takes them into a, 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 a mountain opens up and he goes into the mountain and everybody goes in except a lame child one child doesn't make it and all the children disappear and they're gone and then the town goes into mourning because they've lost their most precious thing which is their children and in a sense that's what's happened the television is like the Pied Piper children have this interesting dual nature on the one hand they're like pests right? they're like rodents people don't like them in the house they cause problems, they break things, they're smelly. Uh, they do a lot of things that really drive parents crazy, particularly men. Men are driven more crazy than women. In fact, some people claim that, you know, that women are, are much more in touch with their children than men are. Because a lot of people say that men just think that there's a bunch of little people living in the house or something. But anyway, they they have this pesty side to them. So what do people do now? They call in the Pied Piper. And they put this child in front of the Pied Piper. And he takes away that pesty element of the child. Because suddenly the child's no longer screaming. It's no longer clamoring for something to do. It's no longer begging the mother to do this or that. It's literally completely pacified in front of a cathode ray tube which has in the back of it something that they literally call, the engineers who designed it, a cathode ray gun.
So it's a gun in the back of that television that's shooting rays. It's a ray gun. I mean, if you've read like Flash Gordon and science fiction, ray guns are what aliens had to kill humans. So this is what's happening. There's a ray gun beaming waves out. Now what people don't realize is, because I, when I was in the Muslim world and I used to ask these scholars about television, they would say, oh, it's just a window. If it's, if it's good, it's good, and if it's bad, it's bad. It's a nafida. That's how they explained it, these ulama. Now there's no window in existence that you can open up which will start beaming cathode rays at you. Right? you if you go out and open up a window in your house, there's no cathode rays that are going to be beamed at you. So what happens when these rays are beamed at people is the brain is also has waves. We have what are called brain waves. Now if you know anything about pendulums, Right? Everybody knows what a pendulum clock is. A pendulum, pendulum clock, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens with pendu pendulum clocks. If you have a clock and you put a whole bunch of pendulum clocks together and then you set them at different times, at a certain point they will do what's called in physics entrain. They all begin to, to in train. In other words, they will begin to tick, moving back and forth at the same uh, rate. So you'll see they entrain with each other. Now they studied this and what they found it was actually oscillatory waves from the strongest pendulum begin to affect the other pendulums and they synchronize eventually. So what happens with this TV is it beams out these waves and, and the brain waves begin to entrain with it. There's an entrainment going on. Your brain is literally going into sync with these cathode rays. That's what's happening. And you go into what's called a hypnagogic state, which is similar to sleep. Or it's even similar to some uh, meditative state. So what happens is you put these children in front of these tubes and they, they, they're basically hypnotized. Now one of the things about hypnosis is people that are in a hypnotic state are open to suggestions. They're open to suggestions. And this is why if you've ever seen a good hypnotist, and they do this, they'll say, raise your right hand. And this person who's in a hypnotic trance will suddenly go like this. And then he'll say, raise your left hand. They'll go like that. They then cross them over, go like that. And these are suggestions that he's putting in. And because this person's in a passive receptive state, he will do them without resistance. So you put this child in front of this TV and then they have these things called important messages from the sponsor. Now if you translate that into Arabic, which I like to do with these things because it kind of explains to you what important message. Risala muhimma. That's important message in Arabic. Risala muhimma. Now, Risala is actually the word for what the Prophet brought. That's, that's the Arabic word for what he brought, an important message from God. But this is not an important message from God, it's an important message from somebody who thinks he's God. Now, what, what does he tell these children? Well, he has very cute characters that are done usually round because they've done psycho psychological analysis on children and they realize that children don't like square. They tend to interpret square as being evil and round as being good. So you'll notice that most of these cartoon characters are rounded characters, like the Pillsbury Doughboy. He's round. And you'll notice that the evil characters tend to have square faces. So whenever they show Muslims and things like that, and they get these square-faced people, right, to do that. This is really, I mean, it's well thought out stuff. So they have these children in front watching this, and, and then this character comes on like Tony the Tiger. And Tony the Tiger, it's alliteration, it's got a little kind of, you know, sound cute. And, and he does these things like, 
roars. Children like that, you know, roaring and things like that. So he watches these things, and before you know it, then the mother's taking him to the, the store, and, and if you notice at the store, because they all work together, all these corporations hire the same companies to do the same research. You'll notice that children's uh, cereal is all on the bottom shelf because children are little people and it's hard for them to look up. But when they're down there walking with mom and they go down that aisle, they look and suddenly they see Tony. And he thinks Tony's his friend. Because Tony talks to him on the TV. And children have a hard time distinguishing reality from, uh, from virtual reality. Right? Real phone. Right. <laughs> so suddenly the child's screaming, I want that. Now at that point, the mother's got a problem. Now some of them have gotten clever and they bring the Pied Piper with them so they give them when they go into the store one of these games that they can play, like a Nintendo type game. So the kids there are doing that. And you know, that's between Ritalin. See they're all wondering why their children are all on Ritalin because they're hyperactive. Well, another thing about television that you should notice about children's television, it's all speeded up. Did you ever wonder why that is? Why is Sesame Street in fast motion? Did you ever wonder that? Why Sesame Street is in fast motion? And A is for Allah is in fast motion as well. Or A is for Asad. They didn't even get that one right. And this is for Asad. There's a video, quote unquote Islamic video, called Alif is for Asad. And that's in fast motion too, because I actually watched it, it gave me a headache. <laughs> now, the reason that these things are in fast motion is because back in the 1950s they did studies on children watching TV and they realized that children under four won't watch normal time TV. They'd actually rather be in reality. It's more interesting to them. But when they speed it up slightly, it engages their minds. And they'll actually, they'll, they'll be hypnotized by that fast movement, like cartoon movement. And what happens is before long they've been trained and then they can't pull away. They're literally entrained to the television, they can't pull away. And that's why you go up to the child and you go like this. Do that, it's just an experiment. Just go up to your little brother and go like that and he won't see you for three or four times. And then finally he'll come out. You break the entrainment because you're breaking the waves. That's what you're doing when you do that. You're breaking the waves and the entrainment's broken and suddenly he's like, leave me alone. Because he wants to go back. And then he'll just leave me alone and then he'll re-lock into the television, right? I'm not making this stuff up. People, do you think I'm making this up? This is happening all over the world right now. There are millions of people in this country. There's probably about 200 million people right now in Canada and America sitting in front of cathode ray tubes right now in trains, watching such inane tripe that they have to be told when to laugh with a laugh track. That's not real laughter. It's canned laughter. That's how bad the jokes are. I mean, have you ever noticed how you don't laugh at any of those jokes? Right? Really, if you're intelligent. If you do, it's a sign that you've got an IQ of less than about 70. So don't admit that you do, even if you do. Right? So what the, how does that relate to all of us? Well, now to get to what I want to say. I believe personally that if we are to maintain an Islamic identity, then we have to protect our mind. Your mind is the most precious thing that you have, your heart, and it's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادَ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولًا The hearing, the sight, and the heart. All of those the human being is responsible for. You're responsible for them. Now the thing about 
Why hearing first and then sight and then the heart? The reason the Qur'an almost always has hearing precedes sight. If you look in the Qur'an, you'll always see sama precedes basar. And the reason for that, one of the reasons, is that hearing is circular. It's not linear. The eye looks linearly. Hearing is circular. You can hear people from behind you. You can't protect your ears in the same way that you can protect your eyes. In other words, people have quicker access to your ears than they do to your eyes. If you see something you don't want to look at, you can immediately turn away. But if somebody is telling you something, it's very difficult just to plug your ears. And Abdurrahman al-Awza'i used to do that. When he, was, when he would see Muqtadi'a, he would literally plug his ears. And somebody asked him, why do you do that? He said, one of them said something 20 years ago that's still bothering me. It's still bothering me. Now, this is an imam who plugged his ears when he saw a Muslim who had beliefs that were not uh, congruous with Islam. What do you make of people that have spent 20 years, Muslims, watching kafir television every day of their life? What are we doing? How is that affecting us? How is that affecting us if you turn on your television when you go home and you watch every possible haram thing that's imaginable? One of the things that the ulama say is haram to watch the haram, to look at the haram. What, does, what is that doing to our hearts? And how do we preserve our spiritual integrity if that's the state that we're in? How do we do that? So the first thing I really feel that everybody has to do as Muslims, we have to turn off the TV. How many people, I'm really serious about this, how many people in here are willing to do that? Not that many. I mean, I'm glad that people are honest. I'd rather have honest people than all these hypocrites. Allahu Akbar, takbir. Not that many. I would say probably maybe it looked like about from here maybe 15% of the people. That's a start. In Russia, in Moscow, did people see that? The television, the tower burnt down. So 20 million people didn't have TV. And in one of the newspaper articles I read that was in The Guardian in London, they were interviewing these people and they said, I'm getting to know my family again. <laughs> and one lady said, I hadn't realized how much my husband had aged. <laughs> but they said the parks were filling up, people were actually going down, doing recreational things, walking. People were having to actually talk to each other. People that don't realize, I really don't think they don't realize the impact that this machine has had on our lives. And it's, it's getting worse and worse because it's everywhere now. In the Gulf states, in Arabia, children are growing up on this stuff. My children, who don't watch TV, we were in Spain, and we were with some uh, children from Arabia, and they were, every time I'd see my son, he'd, he'd have this word or new game or something. I said, well, where did that come from? And he said, from uh, so-and-so, that they were playing that game. So I asked the boy, and it was some television program he'd watched. And, and this is a true story. My boy was with an Arab boy, and he drew a picture, and it was a picture of a scholar, and he said that's what he wanted to be when he grew up. And this Arabian boy said to him, No, you should be a CIA agent. <laughs> he didn't even know what the CIA was. I haven't told him about that yet. I'm trying to protect him for a little longer. 
But he said he should be a CIA agent and, 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 and the, his reason was because they had all these cool weapons. And he had seen Mission Impossible. And he thought that that was really cool. So this is what's happening. We have Arabian boys that want to be CIA agents in Mecca. Think about that. Seriously, think about that. And they're the good guys. If you watch most of those movies, right? they're the good guys. So this is what's happening, people. The identity is being fragmented until there's nothing left because these children have been giving this, been given this since they were little kids and then they become completely entrained and brainwashed. So where does that leave us now? We're in this country and we're trying to maintain a semblance of Islamic identity. This is what we're trying to do. Now, just let's look at the message of Islam in relation to this message. First of all, the idea of consumption. The Prophet ﷺ said that there's no fault in a man if he has wealth to change his clothes to go to Jumu'ah from his work clothes. Does everybody understand that? In other words, if somebody has work clothes, because on Friday traditionally Muslims work. Imam Malik said it was makru for Muslims not to work on Friday because he said it was like the Jews and the Christians who took a day off on their holy day. And he said there's no reason why Muslims should do that. So traditionally Muslims work seven days a week, but what they would do is they would work from six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning until about two in the afternoon and then the day was over. That was their work day. And then the rest of the day was for family and for ibadah and, and study, things like that. Anyway, the point of that hadith is that a man who has an extra clothes, if he can afford it, to wear a Friday suit and change it. And the Prophet was saying that there was no haraj, there was no fault in that. And the reason for that is they had an understanding in the Mubadzirina Ikhwan Shayateen that those who are extravagant are the brothers of the demons. Those who are extravagant are the brothers of the demons. Now, the word in Old English, consumer, is the word for the devil. Consumer means the devil in Old English. Because consumption is what the devil does. He consumes souls. So all of these people out here that are consumers, and this is their life, they're actually shayateen. And what you need to decide in your lives is whether you want to be shayateen or whether you want to be with the angels, the malaika. Because in this world, you're in one group or the other. You're with the people of light or you're with the people of darkness. All of our youth here, you have to ask yourselves whether you want to be people that go with the flow, that watch all the latest movies, that buy all the latest CDs, that listen to uh, the coolest or whatever the hippest uh, radio station is. And then you go to school and that's what you do with your friends. You talk about what movies you saw. I mean, how many people now, that's all they have to talk about? Seriously, how many people now that you know, when they get together, what they talk about is what they saw on TV? What movie they saw? What's that? That's what people talk about now. What do you think about that? Are you content with that? To spend your lives watching imaginary people, fictionalized characters portrayed by prostitutes because a prostitute is somebody that sells their, their honor for money. And these people will take off their clothes, they'll pretend to have uh, sexual relations with people that they don't have any emotional feeling for or any legal relationship with. This is what they do. 
and people watch this. You can't watch a PG rated film. The G rated films are filled with sexual innuendos. And if parents think that because it's got a G on it, somehow that makes it okay, because it's for general audiences, you haven't watched any of these films. You haven't thought about what are the messages behind them. These are messages. And they're messages from enemies of humanity. That's the only word for them, because they are Shayamin. And they've declared war on human beings. They have declared war. And it's taken them a long time to get to this stage where they can just come all out now. They couldn't do it back in the 30s and the 40s when there were still Christians in this country. There were still Christians in this country that actually believed that it was blasphemous, that this was against, it was sacrilegious. It took them a long time to get to that stage where they could just keep at it like somebody chiseling. Just keep at it. Keep hammering. Or like water on the rock. You break them down. And eventually it broke. And now they're just full force. Where they can come out with demon worship, films in which criminals are heroes. Criminals are heroes now. Look at how many films in which the hero is a criminal, there's no resolution of good versus evil. Crime pays. These are the stories that are being told to people. They have a story now about a car thief. And it's the joy of stealing cars. How, I know a couple of people have seen this film probably in here. Really, how many people, just be honest with me, how many people, who's willing to really be courageous and say, yes, I saw that? About as many as the, those are the honest ones. There's probably a lot more that ha have seen it. but did, I didn't see it, I wouldn't see it, but the point is, here's a film about a car thief who's a hero, according to what I read. What is that telling you about a culture? It's completely bankrupt. This is the stories that they're telling. And this is the story that many of you are allowing into your mind, into your heart. You don't think that's not having an effect on you? There's images that will be with you as long as you live from some of these films. I have images from films I can't get out of my, my inner eye. I can see them. I can close my eyes and see them. Right? People are laughing. You think this is funny. It's hilarious. That, that's what they want. Just, we'll entertain you. Until you die. They, they can't, there's no VCR in the grave. You don't get to pluck in the video to forget about reality in the grave. There's no DVD there either. There's no CDs, there's no music. It's not there. And either you believe it or you don't, and that's your choice. But if you believe it, my suggestion to you is to recognize what's happening to you. You're under, you're basically possessed. That's what I would call it. If, if you're watching television on a regular basis, then you're under possession. And I would suggest that most of you are probably addicted. You're unable to turn it off. You don't have the willpower to do it. There's probably people that will finish this lecture, go back to their hotel rooms, and turn on the TV. And your brains will entrain. You'll feel comfortable. You kind of get vegged out. Everything's relaxed. Maybe you weren't too troubled by what was said. Or maybe you'll forget about it. You'll, you'll, you might go up and you might say, yeah, maybe he's right. And then, I'll just see what's on. <laughs> oh, I'll watch the news. The news can't be bad. Right? 
So this is what's happening to people. This is our life. This is your life. The precious time that you've been given. This is your life. And it's, it's just wasted away. Dissipated. Until it's all gone. And your youth is going to be gone. Some of you in here are young. You're in the, you're in the prime years for learning. For memorizing. People have a capacity to memorize. I mean, this man here, what's your name? Samir. Samir memorized the Qur'an in two years. But that took effort. That wasn't easy. It took willpower. It took discipline. Consistency. And now it's going to take willpower and effort to maintain it. Because now the, the hard part begins when you finish it. Really. That's the hard part. But on the Yom Qiyamah, according to the Hadith, the, the, the Hufav have a place, they're given a, a maqam, and everybody envies them, يغضطهم. People envy them. So if you put this world in relation to the next world, it'll change your perspective on this world. But if you just stay in this, this zone of illusion and desire and shahwa, you won't think about it. None of you will think about it. You'll just go on with your lives. They'll be empty, meaningless lives. That's what they'll be in the end of the day. You'll have wasted the most precious opportunity that you've ever had. Now, I just was with a Frenchman in, in Spain who had just become Muslim. He'd been a Muslim six months. And, and this man was very serious. During the time that we were there at this uh, study course, he had a dream of Isa السلام, who came to him in a white robe and he said, get ready for the end of time. That's what he told him. And he came to me and told me, he said, what is that dream? He said, I, I felt all this peace in the dream in his presence and I, I felt incredible. And, and then, and I, and he said, what does that mean? Get ready for the end of time. And, and I told him, the, the Muslims, we have a belief about the end of time. The first thing is we believe that the end of time is imminent. And we believe that for the last 1420 odd years. The reason for that is that the Prophet ﷺ was a sign of the end of time. He began the, he actually initiated in the last phase of humanity. So people say, oh, well, people have been saying that for so long and it's doom and gloom and it hasn't come and there's all these movements and all these different things and it never came. Scholars have been saying it's the end of time for centuries. Well, it's a lot closer than it was 1,400 years ago. <laughs> I mean, if 1,400 years has passed and it hasn't come yet, it's a lot closer than it was because the Prophet ﷺ said, بُعِثُ وَسَعَكَ هَاتَيْنِ I was sent and the hour is like these two and he put his two fingers together sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's a sahih hadith بُعِثُ وَسَعَكَ هَاتَيْنِ so he said and I, so I told him that there's the first preparation is preparation for your death because that's the yawm al-qiyamah for you that's, that is the real preparation Somebody came to me today uh, outside and said to him that his son, who was 19, died this year in an uh, accident, car crash. And he said he really uh, benefited from your lectures and things. And he asked for dua. His name was Wasim, the, the boy who died. Rahimahullah. Shall everybody say Rahimahullah. 19 years old. Imagine that. Think of his hopes and aspirations. Think of his parents' hopes and aspirations. He's gone. He's gone. And he's in his grave. That's where he is. He's in his grave. And all he has with him is his actions. That's it. Nothing else to accompany him in his grave. His actions. So that's the end of time in reality. And then there's the, the big end of time where this all comes to an end, which is going to happen. But Allah, Allah Ta'ala Adam, we don't know, I don't know, nobody knows that. It might last for another 100, 200, 300, 400 years. 
Nobody knows that. Nobody knows the hour. So this man came, and that's what he, he said. He said he saw that dream. Now, we spent a month in this place, and at the very end, the last talk that was given, the last words that were said, it was about the drought in Spain and that the earth was dying for sajda to be made on it. And that was the last statement. He came to me afterwards, just as I was leaving, I was on the way, and he said, in this talk that he gave, that, that was given, his last piece of paper finished that he'd had with him for the whole course. On the last line, he wrote the last line of the talk and his ink ran out. Now, what that is, those are indications that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to people. These are things that happen in your life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to let you know that these things are real. That there's a reality. That Islam is true. And most people are completely veiled from these things. They're veiled in their lives, they're hidden from it. And that's what happens. So, my hope is that you begin first and foremost by disengaging from all the messages that are being put into your hearts. If you want to engage reality, the first thing that you have to do is disengage from unreality. And that's a choice every one of you has to make and everyone's capable of making. And that's all I have to say, but I will allow uh, some questions if anybody has any questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لا تحرموا ما أحل الله لا تحرموا طيبات ما أحل الله لكم Don't make good things haram for you ولا تعتدوا إن الله لا يحب المعتدين But don't go to extremes Allah does not love transgressors Don't transgress the boundaries And one of the things that Allah has given us is time And this is the greatest gift Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خصر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. By time the human being is in loss. By time the human being is in loss. The nature of time is you're losing. It's dissipating. It's like the sand clock. Time is running out. Except إلا الذين except those who believe, do good actions, enjoin to truth to what's right, and then enjoin to patience, because if you enjoin to truth, you're going to have tribulation. The point of that is those are the only human beings that are investing their time for the akhirah. The other people are wasting their lives away. Your time is dissipating, your lives are a waste. Some of you in this, the Prophet wasallam, the majority of his initial people were under 20 years of age. Under 20 years of age. Some of them were in their early teens and they were being persecuted for their beliefs. So you have to decide what you want to do with your life. That's what you need to decide. There's 30,000 Muslims convening here, approximately. There were 35,000 registrations. 30,000 Muslims 12,000 Muslims in 711 Christian era, 91 Muslim era, 12,000 Muslims crossed from Tangier to Spain. They were then, in, they fought Christians, they fought 100,000 Christians. It was 30,000 to 100,000. They were unarmed. Ill-equipped, it was in Ramadan. The battle began in Ramadan on the 27th of Ramadan. The 27th of Ramadan, and they defeated the Christians. The Christians had brought chains down to take them slaves. They literally brought all these chains down because they were convinced that they were going to completely wipe out these Muslims. There were only... Twelve Arabs, only twelve, they were almost all North African Berbers. 
There was no Arab invasion of Spain. It was a Muslim invasion of Spain. Now, obviously, times have changed. You don't, you don't, we don't go into battle with swords and, and horses, and we don't fight honorably on battlefields anymore. It's done with aerial bombing, saturation bombing, napalm, radioactive materials and chemicals. Civilians are killed, not soldiers. I mean, the Muslims, when they went into towns, they didn't rape or pillage. Most of the towns surrendered by sulah, with an agreement to pay jizya. They honored that. Women and children were honored. They were not raped. They were not taken into captivity. This is what happened. And that's, this, these are human beings. Today, the Jebel Tariq is named Gibraltar after that man. Tariq ibn Ziyad. That's what he did with his life. He's mentioned in a hadith according to Ibn Hazm There's a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which his aunt, Umm Haram, who was his aunt in Rava'a, she had, uh, through breastfeeding, was his aunt. He came to her house, he ate, and then she began to massage his head, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he fell asleep. And he woke up and he was laughing. And Umm Haram radiallahu anha said, Ya Rasulullah, ma abhakak? What, what made you laugh? And he said, Subhanallah, I saw people from my ummah, ghuzatan fi sabiri la, yaghzuna ala al-bahar, yarkabuna ala al-bahar. They were riding on the ocean, fi sabiri la. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, أَدْعُوا اللَّهِ لِي أَنْ يَجْعَلَنِي مِنْهُمْ Oh Messenger of Allah, pray to God to make me from one of those people. And the Prophet ﷺ, he made a dua for her. And then he fell asleep again. And he woke up and, and he was laughing again, smiling. His laugh was a smile. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, مَا, ما, ما أَضْحَكَكَ مَا يَضْحِكُكَ What's making you laugh? And he said, SubhanAllah, I saw a second group. Of my ummah, Allah showed me a second group, Fisadila, riding the ocean. This is the first Muslim navy. There was no navy. It's a Sahih hadith. And then she said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua that I'm from those. And he said, and, and then he, he, he said they were making the astushidu. She said, make dua that I'm from those. He said, you're from the first group. Khalas. You're not from the second group. You're already from the first group. I made the dua. Now Umm Haram anhu went with Muawiyah. She was on the expedition in which they conquered Cyprus during the time of Uthman ibn Affan anhu. And she was in that expedition when she was coming off. She was on her horse when she was coming off the ship to land on Cyprus. Her horse tripped, she fell and died shahida. Ibn Hazm anhu said that there's no doubt in his mind that the second group was the group of Tariq ibn Ziyad who crossed that straits of Gibraltar and opened up Spain. Now the Prophet wasallam said in a sound hadith, somebody asked him, Ya Rasulullah, which city opens up first? Constantinople or Rome? And he said, the city of Hirqal, which is Constantinople. 800 years later, Muhammad al-Fatih, when he was a young boy studying hadith, he heard that hadith. And he decided to be that person. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Ni'm al-Amir wa Ni'm al-Jaysh. What an excellent leader and an excellent army that will open the city of Constantinople. And he said, this was his himma. I want to be that person. I'm going to be that person. And that's what he set his life out to do. And Constantinople fell at his hands. At his hands. Now the Prophet Wasallam said that the city of Rome would fall after that. The city of Rome would fall after Constantinople to the Muslims. 800 years it took for Constantinople to fall. 
And yet people believe that hadith. Now according to this other hadith, the city of Rome, the Pope city, will become a Muslim city. And we, we, we're, we should believe that. Why should we believe that? And there's no reason why it won't open with, not with weapons, but with da'wah. Because da'wah, and people forget this, is from jihad. Da'wah is in the bab of jihad. There's no bab of jihad, uh, da'wah in any books of fiqh. It's called bab of ahkam uh, al-jihad. The rules of jihad. Da'wah is in the rules of jihad because da'wah is part of jihad. Really. So who, who amongst you wants to be one of those mujahideen? This is your life. You have one life. People say, what do we do without uh, television? Make something of your life. Do something with your life. Be disciplined. Memorize the Qur'an. Learn the deen. Learn your deen. Or even do creative things. Do something creative. Do something that actually there's, there's an end product.